All right. As uh, most of you know at this point, my name is Eric Schnur. I'm the founder of the Greater Good Gathering, and I'm going to uh, wrap us up for the week here. And we have a special guest who is uh, uh, our, our star social entrepreneur <laughs> of the year. Uh, we have one of these every year. It's not that special. And, uh, I'm touched. I'm touched. Uh, as, as you might be able to guess, Kyle and I have known each other for a long time, longer than we'd like to admit. We first met working together at the national headquarters in 1984, Walter Mondale presidential campaign. Uh, I was 12. I just want to say that. <laughs> uh, Thank you. We, we were the only electoral votes in Walter Mondale. Uh, <laughs> still, uh, uh, Tim, Tim's still here. Tim, Tim Shaker was also, uh, I guess he's left. Uh, so the three of us are working on Mondale's campaign back then. Uh, but anyway, uh, at the time, uh, Tim and I and Kyle were all um, either law students or recent law school graduates. Uh, we're all the age of 12 for Kyle. Um, <laughs> Just saying. And head back to great careers in law, and now none of us are practicing law. Uh, I'd like Kyle to start by telling us how she wound up from being a uh, great future lawyer to what she's doing now. Well, I. Uh it's nice to meet you guys. Lovely to be here. I was, uh, I did practice law for seven or eight years, and then I, uh, you know, it was uh, right around 1989, 1990, and the crack epidemic hit Washington, D.C., and I was raised uh, in, in Appalachia, but I was raised to be an activist, and it wasn't okay to sit it out when your hometown was struggling the way Washington was, and many urban areas were struggling. So I started volunteering at a, at a soup kitchen uh, in their tutoring program after work a few nights a week. And I, you know, I just started, uh, you know, every night there'd be 50 or 60 kids who would come in and they'd of course be looking for something to eat, but they would also be looking for uh, adults and a safe place to be. And the more time I spent there, the more time I realized, number one, I'm not a teacher. That may be increasingly apparent to everyone who's hearing me right now. But, but I also realized that some of the fundamental resources that, you that I took for granted growing up, books, were not in the lives of uh, these kids, either in their schools or in their after-school programs, and certainly not in their homes. And so, that was the that was the question: How do you crack open uh, the resource needs for kids in sort of 360-degree surround sound for them? So the, the result of that was uh, an organization which I unfortunately, uh, when we were talking on the phone this week, I kept referring to it as Facebook. It's not Facebook, it's first, first book. Uh, so tell, tell us about first book, what it does. Sure. So at the heart of First Book's now 28 years old, and we have continued to evolve over all these years. At the heart of First Book is an uh, we've aggregated an online community of over 460,000 members, and these are individuals who are uh, teachers, preschool, after school. Uh, healthcare workers, some people who are even working in barber shops and doing wonderful outreach in their community, but all of them are working in the lives of kids in poverty. And that network, that online community, is growing by about a thousand members a week and has been for about the last three or four years. And what we do is we, the, no one's ever tried to aggregate the full breadth of people in the lives of kids in poverty before. And so what we have done is we've built social enterprises underneath that network in order to serve their needs. First is called the First Book Marketplace. The First Book Marketplace is an e-commerce site. Uh, we have negotiated with the publishers and I won't drag you through the economics behind it, but it, in essence, some of the books that you see that are award-winning books on the shelves at Barnes & Noble and other retailers are available through us uh, at an average price of about $3.20 per, and that includes shipping. We uh, have expanded what we offer to try to address all the needs that we hear 
from our network, including winter coats and hygiene kits for homeless kids and you know just a full range of every imaginable resource. Uh, to give you a sense of size, we run about somewhere over $100 million worth of inventory through that system now annually. Um, and we have uh, placed about $1.7 billion worth of uh, goods through that, through that website, all either free or as close to free as we can get it. Uh, the second arm is a research arm, and it's called First Book Research and Insights. What we realized is that while data is king for, in almost every other category of the universe, data and analysis uh, by and about kids in need is, is delayed and highly inconsistent. And so we're building the first ever uh, data bank and, and research arm that's focused exclusively on kids in need in North America. The third arm, and this is the last one I'll, I'll put you through, but there are a few other experiments, is called the accelerator. And what the accelerator recognizes is that there are great people at a lot of wonderful institutions that are uh, coming up with breathtaking, deeply research-based strategies <coughs> excuse me, to uh, help kids on everything from child development to uh, toxic trauma to lots of issues that this population of kids is uh, struggling with. But there's a big chasm in between the thought leaders and the practitioners, right? And so a great idea that someone here at Columbia might come up with, it'll be 20, 30, or never years when that actually hits the street with the practitioners we serve. So there's uh, three quick points I want to bring out about uh, first book, and then we'll, we'll bring the students down to starting and acting with us. Um, number one, um, we've had some talk, especially in the last panel, about the, the need to essentially recycle everything in the economy, that there's a huge amount of waste, and that there's therefore a huge potential in our economy for economic growth and for wealth creation um, not through, uh, as Ronald Reagan once put it, running out more slowly, but through tapping into all the resources that we're, we're essentially throwing away and not making the most of. Now, um, and you're going to correct me on everything, I'm sure, but as, oh, I, yeah. as, as I understand it, uh, essentially the, uh, the, those books you were talking about at Barnes and Noble, you're getting for a few dollars. Before you were getting them for three dollars, um, they were basically getting thrown away. No. No, okay. But there, there is a category of inventory that we offer that's donated inventory from the publishers that's brand new, that's unsold. That is true, and that happens. Those are available for about 60 cents a piece. All the rest of it, which is the lion's share, is purchased inventory that we purchase on a non-returnable basis. We're the largest specialty buyer for most children's publishers in the U.S. In Canada now. So that those are books that have never hit a shelf anywhere. We choose them by hand. We choose them one at a time. Now, um, if you correct me on this, because you've got to do this part wrong, too. <laughs> this, is, this is a non-profit, but it, it, I wouldn't say it makes a profit, but it's a self-sustaining economic model. And this is real important to you know, basically the, the origins of this whole greater good conference, which came out of a discussion that several of us have had about what's the future of making a difference. And I mean, a big part of that is the, the blurring of lines between different categories of organizations we think of as separate today. And in the future, uh, governments are going to have to figure out how their activities can be economically self-sustaining. And that uh, uh, businesses and social ventures aren't going to totally blend into one. But there, there is increasingly a need for businesses to have a, a different bottom line where they're looking at uh, uh, making a, a difference or the ways in which their activities interact with the world, and that a lot of, of uh, doing good, and you know, ultimately, uh, charities have to make money in one way or another, or they cease to exist, no matter how you bring in your money. But figuring out how you can do good while having an economically self-sustaining model, mm -hmm. uh, and or an economically self-sustaining model, a business that is actually doing good for the world instead of eating down, uh, is really the, the key issue in what's happening in the public sector, private sector, and the kids and their achievement in the, the next generation or so. Um, Kyle's organization, First Book, has been, I, I think, remarkably successful in doing that. I want to talk a little bit about what that is. 
Sure. I, I think, you know, when we started building this, econ what is, it's all nonprofit. First book is a 501c3. But uh, when we started it, it was, you know, and especially when we really amped up the e-commerce uh, part, which was maybe 18 years ago, 19 years ago, something like that, um, it was not yet fashionable to have a social enterprise, especially one that, uh, you know, that, that the base of the pyramid, the people we were serving were in, in fact paying for the resources they were receiving from us, albeit at a much lower level than they could have ever gotten them at retail. But it's important for a lot of reasons. One is we have tried as a society to provide everything for free and do it, uh, make social ma massive social changes based on the kindness of strangers, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work long term, you know? And secondly, when you've got, when what you're doing is uncovering a brand new market, the publishing industry, you know, they are victims of their own industry design because when you're selling $19 picture books, by definition, you're really only selling to the top 5% on a consistent basis uh, of the economic ladder, right? And so what that means is uh, the people at the bottom, in the bottom third, they are not represented as authors. They're not represented in the content. They're not, re their voice is not heard. They are not a market that the publishing industry addresses their product to, right? And so not only is it too high priced, it's also irrelevant in large part to the kids we're trying to serve. So by building a market, you actually lower the price but you also bring that market strength to a group of people who have never had a voice. And so we've been aggressively pushing the industry to increase the diversity of their authors, to increase the kinds of stories they tell, the kinds of family structures they, they show in their books, to the kinds of countries and cultures that are highlighted and, and celebrated, right? And you can't do that if what you're doing is trying to do it all based on contributed books. You've got to bring market strength into the conversation. So for lots of reasons, it's really important that it's designed that way. In addition, yeah, I can keep my lights on, right? Which, really helpful, I'm just saying. Uh, and that's a good, I mean, the final point about the lights, it's a good segue to the third point that I want to make, which, um, building on what works and input from the field to improve what you're doing in a way that I'd like to see governments doing more of and they basically don't. So this is uh, something we see more in the social enterprise. Right. Do you want me to say two words about it? Yeah. The uh, two. So we started by surveying our network, this 460,000 members, and listening to them and they would tell us not only you know, what they thought about what we were already offering, but what the else they needed. I mean, that's how we recognize the need for winter coats, which are now on the site. And so increasingly, a lot of the decisions that we make programmatically are based on the direct feedback from our constituents, from our educators. And now we've actually built that into a research arm that is also giving feedback on healthcare issues, on um, issues relating to food insecurity and housing. And so it's become a platform for a massive group of people to comment on, you know, the rest of the pressures in their lives, right? Yeah. So besides the public policy aspects of this, this kind of customer feedback uh, is becoming a big field in a, a number of areas, particularly important in social venture, and uh, goes by a couple of Design thinking, and uh, Allison here is a first year student, second year student at, here at here at SIPA. Got a working mic. Um, here, um, and uh, is uh, has 
enrolled in the uh, yeah. social entrepreneurship and social design program, yes. uh, working with Harlem Children's Zone this semester. So um, I wanted you to talk about uh, what got you interested in that and what exactly, for people here who don't know, what, what is human-centered design or design thinking and how is that applicable to, um, uh, to social venture, particularly here at Harlem Children's Zone? Okay. But first, I want you to tell them a little something about you. Oh, she's, exciting. She's, she's, what are you, 25? 26. 26. You have 26. Longer resume. Um, well, thank you. I don't think, um, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot, but I, uh, my name's Allison Rogan. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here and get to um, hear from all the speakers that came, that came before our panel. Um, so I'm a second year student at SEPA. I'm studying urban and social policy and management. Um, prior to coming to uh, Columbia, I worked for Bloomberg Philanthropies um, for their foundation in a number of roles, most recently their women's economic development portfolio and then for their corporate philanthropy. As you all might have seen the news, um, there's been ex exciting last couple of months um, and I'm now full time on the campaign as well, um, which has been a whole, a whole new set of experiences. Um, so as you're saying... Yeah, if anyone wants to talk campaign after that, I'll save that until after the, after the conference. But um, you know, I have some extra buttons in my bag that I can pass out. Um, so I'm in this um, awesome new class that launched this semester called Design for Social Innovation. Um, it is a project-based class that has students from seven schools across the university. And we're placed with a client. Um, we have a few clients that are New York City-based and a few international. So does anyone know Harlem Children's Zone or who in the room is familiar with Harlem? Most of the hands go up, so I'll, I'll jump over that quickly. Um, but my, uh, the client that we're working with this semester is Harlem Children's Zone, which takes a um, comprehensive approach to ending intergenerational inter poverty in Harlem. And we're tasked with this really big problem. It's, you know, the organization came to us and it's like, we have a duplication of services we believe in our organization. And as students, the six of you, you know, kind of figure out how, how we can fix this. And I think in any other class, we would have been like, all right, let's divvy this up. You take a research analysis. You start making a list of solutions. You make the PowerPoint presentation and go. But this class has kind of flipped it on its side. And we've used a lot of the elements that you talked about um, when going through this design thinking process. And it's like, let's, let's step back. Let's first you know, understand the problem from those that are experiencing it, from the community. We cannot come in as like Columbia students being like, we designed this new project for you. And here you go, and you know we'd like an A and like a good mark from our, um, you know, from our professor. And instead, it's okay. When kind of what is design thinking? And it's like understanding the problem from those that are actually experiencing it. Have you gone and talked to stakeholders? Have you interviewed the organization? Have you, you know, this week in class? I see a couple of my classmates here, so thank you guys for coming. Um, we had a big whiteboard and sticky notes. We're like, okay, let's map out all the stakeholders. If we wanted to like solve a problem with the organization, who has power here? Who doesn't? What does that say about the organization, the community, the neighborhood? You know, I we're tasked with this big question. And you know, how can we, you know, solve duplication of efforts, but we're not even at a point where we have a solution yet because we, we don't even know enough about the organization because we need to, you know, take all these steps and understand this problem from, you know, different perspectives. Um, so kind of when you and I had met to kind of talk about what is design thinking and what does it really mean to you, it's, I think of it as like a, a toolbox of sorts that I'm really lucky to have the opportunity to get to add some tools to my theoretical toolbox this semester at school um, of learning how to think differently about things that we already know and think differently about how to solve problems. What else? We're going to hear more about human-centered design and get a discussion going on that uh, from the, the first of our actual student ventures, uh, who was the winner two years ago of the Dean's competition here at SEPA for uh, uh, student social ventures. Uh, the rest of the folks uh, who you'll be hearing from just finished the semi-final round. So we've done a presentation already today, uh, hoping that they'll be the big winners Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to be back here. This is actually where a lot of the pitches happened for, <laughs> for VTI. So this, sounds, this feels very um, traumatizingly familiar. <laughs> um, I'm, my name is Shanna Crumley, as he mentioned. I was uh, the co-founder of VTI Technologies, which is a, we 
it's called Vitae based on curriculum Vitae with a B because we were building a digital backpack of secure verified credentials. So basically trying to turn any types of skills, both alternative skills, but also formal and informal skills and education experiences, work experience, all of those skills into credentials that are transferable and portable in a way that works better with the 21st century and the way that migration and learning and work happens now. Um, we were focused most specifically on job seekers um, in, across the Middle East and the refugee population. And we were building this backpack in a way that could be um, verified by the blockchain, using the blockchain um, to create these portable and um, verifiable credentials that you could actually verify both ends of a transaction for the first time. So not only did it, do I say that I went to Columbia SIPA and graduated two years ago, but SIPA also agrees that I came here and I graduated two years ago. And I can take that diploma, that piece of information, out from under my mother's bed, which is where all of my credentials and my certifications and diplomas are for now, um, take them out from there and create a credential that I can then show and prove um, as I go from place to place and from job to job. Um, so we were building this up as a um, as a social enterprise here in D or here in um, New York. Uh, at this point, it's on pause, and so I'm here today to talk about what that process looked like from, um, from winning the Dean's Challenge here at SIPA, starting up over the year afterwards, the Columbia um, uh, Startup Lab, um, and then how it's also carried over into my work today, um, continuing to work at technology and innovation for good. So I'm happy to be here. Definitely. Um, I think that's probably something that's very common across social enterprise specifically, not so much perhaps other kinds of enterprise, is that you have a reason. You have a hook that got you into this and you have something that gets you out of bed in the morning and something that always brings you back to this work. Um, and refugees for me, it started out, um, I mean I had a background in community development and um, I mean working with English second language speakers and kind of that side of the refugee population but then I first really started working with refugees as an intern at the State Department um, right when Syria started to really heat up as a refugee crisis um, zone so I was at the State, Depar the State Department um, when, one, when they hit one million refugees coming out of Syria and I think now it's over six million. Um, and counting. So it's a very formative experience to, to see that from a policy level, um, like the billions of dollars and the millions of people affected and how policy from the State Department was applied to that. Um, and then right before I came to SIPA, between that time and coming to SIPA, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Colombia, so working with displaced um, students and displaced persons um, coming from internally displaced mostly in Colombia from, um, from internal conflict and seeing how that trickles down um, at the community level. And then right before SIPA, um, my husband and I, or my fiance at the time, I guess, and I um, drove across Europe to volunteer briefly in a refugee camp in Greece, um, working with Afghan, primarily Afghan refugees um, in, in a refugee camp there north of Athens. And that was kind of the other end of the spectrum. So from the State Department, you see the, the millions and billions, and then working at this very small, very under-resourced um, camp in, in Greece, we saw the other end, where none of that trickles down as much as you, as you hope and think it will. Um, and then also the problems that we're trying to solve on the ground. Um, we were building a school from scratch, um, the education program, the school building was there. <laughs> um, nothing that we were trying to deal with was really affected by those policies. So even if the trickle down had happened, even if the funding did get, you know, come through for education, it wasn't gonna help my kids in that camp. Um, and it certainly wasn't gonna help them when they needed it, which is now. These kids are, on average, you spend 25 years now um, in transit as a refugee. Um, and so what good is it to, to finally get, you know, primary and elementary education to that camp if my primary schoolers are now unemployed um, youth or um, working in very, you know, exploited in some way um, in the workforce um, as adults. So how can you meet that need um, more closely and more accurately, um, and like to the point of human-centered design, in a way that people are actually asking for? Because you know, so so often policy um, 
tasks the users or the humans um, involved either too late or not at all. And I think that social enterprises are a unique way to go directly to the people who are actually affected and involved and happen to have incredible ideas themselves of how to fix these problems. So how can you start from that level and, and discuss this on a case-by-case um, case and on a ground level um, and come up with solutions that way? Yeah, I think that um, I'm thinking back on the conversation that we had, I think it was the last week, and the thing that I was pressing back on was not that I didn't experience the same things and go through some of those experiences and see that there is often a difference between the experience of men and women or males and females in, um, in social entrepreneurship. I think that the thing that you brought up specifically that I pushed back on was thinking the idea that human-centered design is inherently feminine. I think that I don't. I wouldn't say that I came into this work because I'm a woman. Um, uh, but there have been struggles. I find in general women are much more sensitive to other people than men are, and you, injecting customer-centered things into that process. The the people who have brought that up with me have consistently been women. Been women. Well, that's that's men's problem, not women's problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do, I, I think it's an interesting well, notion, though. <laughs> I am not even going there uh, <laughs> with you on that, and Eric, I've known you for 40 years. On this. <laughs> you know, I guess I think there, uh, there's study after study after study showing that, just like with VC in the private sector, uh, you know, the, the batting average of equally positioned, equally credentialed women looking for financing mm -hmm. and fundraising, you know, depending on which side of the line you're on, uh, it, it's the batting average for women is, it doesn't reflect their credentials or their ideas. And, and that, that's, it's, it's a problem in the U.S. It's a problem, I, like you can look at the Schwab Foundation Fellows, you can look at the Shoka Fellows, it's the, it is a universal problem, uh, bar none, uh, you know, and, and it doesn't mean it's every interaction, but statistically speaking, it's a problem, it is. I mean, like, we're not immune in the social sector. So I'm gonna be an insensitive male, cut you off at this point, and cool. move on to the next, the next <laughs> presenter. Um, uh, so Eddie and Libby, you wanna come on down? Thank you. 
graduates from universities like all of us, but these are graduates from professional high schools, us, which uh, they contribute like the biggest portion of the unemployment. And uh, how many of them? So in Indonesia, uh, professional students are up to 53% of total students. So we think that empowering them means empowering a generation. So based on our analysis, we found a huge gap between the students and the employers because they said they designed, uh, they are designed to uh, get a job after the professional schools. So the, the missing link or the gap is more, uh, the, 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 the cost is more on first, the students have limited knowledge on themselves. They don't know, you know, like the skills, the strength, or the weaknesses uh, uh, in, 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 in terms of soft skill or hard skills. Because the fact that most of them are coming from low income family. So they actually go to, to professional schools, not because they are interested in the subject, like engineering, you know, like mechanical or electrical engineering, but because of the pressure from the family to get a job as soon as possible to get some money. So we try to also analyze from the employer side. So employers are hesitant to employ them because they believe that professional students are lacking in soft skills, like communication skills that um, maybe it's like some of us learned during the four year college, uh, like teamwork skills, problem solving, and also uh, grit to work. So um, our social enterprise, uh, professionals try to solve that big gap, the missing link, to uh, artificial intelligence based job online platform. Thank you so much. So, um, like, uh, like most of our social ventures, what brought you to this particular um, uh, venture and subject, as I understand it, is basically uh, personal experiences of each of you, uh, which are somewhat different. Uh, thanks, Eric, for the opportunity. Uh, it's kind of a pleasure for us to share. So uh, the reason why we, we take this issue into the CIPA Dean's Challenge because this issue has been a paramount issue that is not only one person or 100 person, but 5.3 million students in vocational school, which is at the same scale as the whole country of Singapore, Norway, and Finland. So even though it's only uh, the issue in Indonesia, but the scale is huge, and I think the impact is also huge. And talking about personal experience, I do myself came from this vocational high school, which Lindy has told you, like uh, the stigma from people about the vocational high school graduate is at below par of this, the quality of the general high school, which is actually such an irony. And also another problem that they face is not only about how to how they're pretty hard to get a job, but also it's hard for them to determine what is actually the next step they want to do. Because like for my experience, like I went to the vocational high school taking the degree in information technology into IT. But then it's like when it was like me in 50 years old, what do I know about this uh, field? What do I know about this knowledge? It's only about my parent asked me to go to the vocational high school and expect me to go to work directly. But then like I was pretty lucky because I got the scholarship to continue to the higher education. But then I took finance degree. At the time I did not get any support at all uh, from my environment, from my peer, from my teacher, from my parents. So in this platform later, we would like to offer the feature that we call as AI-based uh, identification test. So the, the platform enable the student to get know further about their qualities, about their character, and even what is the appropriate job for them, even they will understand what is the skill gap they, they could uh, upskill in order to get that targeted job. So this platform will be a support system for them to get to know further about their passion. Because we know that based on our uh, interview with the uh, 
HR department who recruit the, the student from the vocational high school, their biggest concern about the vocational graduate is about their lack of soft skill and their readiness to work. And we get further what is actually the one that drive this stigma. Because like, first, they are actually not ready enough. Or second, they're not actually doing something that they're passionate in. Because they're as young as 15 years old, they have to learn about uh, mechanical engineering, they have to learn about IT, but is that actually the one they want to do? Uh, uh, those gap has created a paramount in when they get into the workplace. That's why this platform is created for them to get them to fully understand their self-discovery and then we'll help them and giving them the recommendation what they're going to do after that. Yeah. Um, I'm coming from the regular high schools and then go to university uh, and then now unfortunately um, I'm able to be here in SIPA. So my experience on youth unemployment may be similar with uh, Shana, more on volunteering. So during my work in consulting firm, I often volunteered uh, in the, uh, youth, youth empowerment program uh, because I'm, you know, like, I think education is very critical, especially in Indonesia. I mean, because the thing that um, uh, e the East part of Indonesia is still like underdeveloped, you know, even like we don't have inf infrastructure, well, infrastructure, road, something like that. So we sometimes like don't expect uh, the, the uh, high quality schools in the uh, is part of Indonesia. So that's actually triggered me to do like volunteering uh, all over Indonesia. And then through that uh, experience, I understand that government po try to reduce the unemployment through introducing or promoting the vocational schools. But the, the, the things is actually um, in vocational schools itself, they just only like teaching hard skill, hard skill, hard skill. Because uh, the I think the assumption is if the students are able to do you know like mechanical things or being a plumber something like that they can get a job immediately you know like quickly but the, the things is actually soft skill are also really important but I don't know how, you know like at that time I don't know how to balance soft skill and skills uh, and hard skill so during that uh, uh, time, um, volunteering in many uh, um, young uh, youth empowerment program, I think we need something like this. I think there is something missing. That, and then I talked to Eddie, which he is coming from uh, vocational uh, schools. So um, we try to like solve this through maybe like small uh, application, but like it empowers. Uh, the young uh, students of uh, vocational students at least to know themselves like better yeah uh, actually guys um, Dustin Martello I'm part of Ali spot uh, Ali spot is an aggregation of municipalities parking solutions uh, in thought of self-driving vehicles driving to drive around the it was brought about by our understanding that each municipality has a different parking solution, uh, and in doing so, they work independently of each other. So if you take a car that wants to drive from, let's say, Washington to Florida, you're going to work through many different municipalities and many different parking solution providers. In doing so, you have, there's an impediment for each self-driving car that's not powered by a person, per se, to then pay to park. Uh, private organizations have done a great job aggregating and collecting the private organizations of garages and such. But municipalities have no incentive to work together um, in the sense of self-driving vehicles. So it's a way of allowing more access to the parking solutions of each city. Uh, a little bit extra to that, um, as we see New York City having um, kind of surge pricing for vehicles, especially in, in the downtown area, what's going to happen from, like, let's say, 7 to 9 in the morning, you're going to have a bunch of self-driving autonomous cars driving around. But they're not going to serve anybody between the off hours, the 9 to 11, the, the 2 to 4. Uh, however, it's cheaper for self-driving cars to drive around the city than it is to 
park. So you're going to have cars that are worthless, in a sense, for many different hours of the day because they don't want to pay to park. It, you know, they're going to put a strain on city infrastructure. Uh, and with city infrastructure and a drain on that, it's going to create more and more costs for the city to help the city and the roads. More cities and roads, more costs to the city, less grants, less, less costs and uh, money for U.S. taxpayer. Keep your mic. Sit down. Yeah, so. And that, that, that last point kind of struck me when we were talking before that uh, in some ways that's kind of counter to the general narrative out there that the self-driving cars are going to lead to less congestion, less po pollution, and you have a completely different view on that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you can think about it, um, you know, when do we all commute? And we commute in the morning, we commute in the afternoon, so the subways are as business. Um, but that being said, what do they do in those off hours? Um, I'm not going to pay the park if I don't have to, and a self-driving vehicle costs somewhere around the, the, the area of 49 to 69 cents an hour to operate. Um, and that's with maintenance and things like that. The self-driving car is an electric vehicle, right? Um, however, a to pay to park, we all know, seven to twenty dollars in New York City, depending upon where we are. Very, very similar to other cities. Obviously, New York's a, a different beast, but this, the same business model and economics apply to many other um, metropolises and municipalities around the country. And uh, you, you too have a uh, personal story that that both brought you to this venture and brought you to New York to begin with. Uh, you're, you're a veteran, and you, you, you came here for a different purpose originally. I did. I'm um, kind of a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I came from a start for a startup. Uh, we're coming from Dallas, Texas. And said, Dallas, Texas, you got everywhere. And I brought a car. It's not the smartest idea in the world. But I brought a vehicle. Uh, and then I tried to park it on the streets in Brooklyn. Um, and, and that being said, I quickly found that you had side street parking everywhere in Brooklyn. It just was a complete waste of time. And, a lot of annoyance. And in seeing so, you see, these, see the individuals double park, and more and more so you think to yourself, why can't I give a guy, or woman, uh, $20 a morning, and they move my car from one seat to the other, to the end, to the next. It, it makes perfect sense. So when knowledge-based workers are working, rather than worrying about moving their vehicle, I can pay an individual in the corner $20, and he move or she move, uh, all the vehicles from one side of the street to the next. So I spent many, many months working with the actual city, the Department of Transportation here in the city, to aggregate actually a, a manpower workforce so that we could put individuals on the streets, which is it's just like Brooklyn, Williamsburg, uh, and the outer boroughs, so we can aggregate and actually have a man, manpower force to move the cars. And then little or, by little, or, or person power, as we call person it. Person power. Um, and then little by little, I realized that as these ballets, we were calling them, uh, were moving vehicles that couldn't do anything after. They were twiddling their thumbs, waiting to move them back after that hour and a half. And I could realize we could make money in every city, um, creating parking citations by just a picture and a video and GPS data of the cars and how they're parked, how they're parked illegally. And that's how I learned how it was a pain in the butt to work with municipalities. So I found that it was actually easier to work with private organizations rather than city organizations because traditionally, I can say traditionally, but I haven't met them all yet, uh, they're slow, uh, they're not so quick to innovate, uh, and they're difficult to, to get past the bureaucracy. And uh, Shana, I want to come back to something that, that I don't think we really talked about here before, but but you and I talked about it when we met last week, that one of the things that motivated you to go from when you first came to SEPA and you saw yourself as kind of a, you know, I mean, a career in government and doing public policy, you realize social venture is the thing because um, as uh, uh, Kyle and I and others in the room have discovered, working with governments cannot be uh, fun. Um, and uh, you saw so social venture is a way of getting around bureaucracies, is that right? <laughs> but we're, we're hoping to free you. Of course. Well, for a good reason, because I think that there is still, um, it's two sides of the same coin. It's those, we need more tech and innovation for good, one way or another. Um, but yeah, I did. I, I originally thought that I would go back into um, into public speaking more directly, like um, the federal government or um, maybe back to the State Department at that time. But then that experience with Nick Frank, the Cisco volunteer, um, so working in like very All right, um, William, you'll be the next one. All right. 
we're going to continue the gender separation here. So w one point I want to bring out for this audience in particular was um, you designed this as a pop-up, right? Yep. Am I using the right term? Yep. Not, not, uh, web extension or plugin. Plugin, yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Instead of uh, as an app. Yep. And what was the rationale for that? Well, Dustin's actually there. We, we met with uh, some more savvy Silicon Valley tech folks uh, than I am and that, than a lot of the entrepreneurs in our program are. Um, and they were saying people only use like three apps, right? And on a daily basis, they open up Instagram eight times or they open up Facebook or they're shopping, but they don't really use an extra app because you tell them to use it. Uh, it has to have an intrinsic value that rises above most other things that they do with their day. And so we thought, okay, why not just, so this person recommended, why not just put it online so that it's sitting there while you're browsing, doing things on your computer, uh, specifically shopping. And so it'll pop up uh, and say, it looks like you're about to buy this shirt. Um, would you like to consider donating 25 cents extra to offset the carbon uh, of that purchase and essentially be neutral? And so that's our starting point. The next phase is a lifestyle, uh, what we're kind of calling offset lifestyle, which is actually in, an, in a mobile app. And that would be, you answer questions about how much meat you eat a week, um, how much you travel by car, uh, what you do, about plane travel versus train travel, et cetera, and then you can offset that cost every month. Um, but in general, the money, either way, will go towards one of two places. Uh, the first is scrubbing, so we're operating, we're, we're providing a revenue stream to operate carbon scrubbers, um, which takes carbon out of the atmosphere uh, at whatever rate the individual res is responsible for. So if you pay $20, that's you know operating however, much it would cost to operate the carbon scrubber for that amount of time. 
Um, and then the second place it would go into, is into green investment pots. So you can get returns on your investment um, in green startups, green products, uh, and anything that operates on a green energy mix. Well, thanks. And now, obviously, this is a very data-heavy enterprise. Uh, we spent a lot of today talking about the perils of data and how it's going to ruin all of our lives. But obviously, there are ways in which it can make a positive contribution. Uh, our, our last uh, student presenter has a very, very data-heavy uh, enterprise. And Pranav, I want you to come down and tell us all about it. And uh, miraculously, we have the right number of microphones. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Pranav, I'm the founder of CityCo. <coughs> CityCo stands for City Climate Company. And true to our name, our mission is to replace the vicious <coughs> urban heat cycles of heat followed by increased demand for energy for cooling, which itself generates greater heat. We want to replace those vicious cycles with virtuous cycles of urban greening and green infrastructure. So the problem that we are trying to solve is urban heat. So I'm gonna give you some numbers just for context. A one degree rise in urban temperature beyond what any city classifies as its heat threshold, on average creates about 17% 17 increased energy demand. And one, uh, basically air conditioning itself is responsible for heating urban temperatures in nighttime by one degree. So I found that stat a little baffling. Apart from that, another interesting stat is that one degree rise in urban temperature can leads to 39 point deterioration in urban air quality index, uh, puts 1.2 more million people at risk of water scarcity, and it causes about 3% more people to be hospitalized for pulmonary illness. I mean, I've read so many stats, I can go on and on on the impact of a one degree change. In dollar terms, that means that every city incurred a, a cost of the order of billions of dollars in lost economic activity and in dollar terms. So New York City in 2019 approved a $20 billion budget for its climate adaptation strategy. So that's the problem we're trying to address. So our solution, like Eric said, is very data heavy. So we're trying to combine geospatial data on surface heat islands on which we're trying to overlay a layer of green infrastructure through machine learning and uh, supervised machine learning. Uh, we're starting with urban farms because now it's really possible at a 0.8 meter resolution to get a very granular picture of an urban farm and get a machine learning to learn about a layer of urban farms in a city. And for each of those farms, we're then overlaying a whole host of other types of information. One is temperature at, its, at the farm, surface temperature, air temperature, and temperature from IoT uh, devices fitted in the farm. Uh, we also build a gradient of temperature as you move radially away from the farm to see where the heat mitigation impact falls off. So that kind of advises investors on where exactly to place infrastructure. Uh, apart from this, we also pull in weather forecast information to see when the heat island will rise again and set a tone for urgency for investment. Uh, apart from this, we pull in uh, voices that of citizens who are voicing their sentiment on climate-related investments on surveys, put it through text analytics, and kind of mine for sentiment uh, at a neighborhood level, uh, and also mine for keywords on what problems they're trying to uh, specifically voicing. Uh, the other thing we're able to pull is economic indicators uh, on all these problems that I mentioned that are directly related to urban heat. Are there more water scarcity incidents? Are there more, uh, you know, instances of dengue fever outbreaks and things like that. Uh, and we're trying to geotag and bring this together at a neighborhood level. So in short, we believe that in an ideal state, if we're able to do urban farms, we can do other types of green infrastructure, reflective surfaces, and then we grow into a whole large collection of data for the world, entirely new data points. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So um, obviously, these folks are doing really great creative things to make the world better and address virtually all the problems we spent the last 28 hours or whatever it was talking about. Um, 
uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to stick Kyle in a, a cab to head out of town fairly soon. Um, so uh, I wish we had another half hour to, to talk about all this stuff, but we're going to wrap up pretty quickly. I'd like to ask each of the students to give us a one-minute answer to a question, and then I'll have Kyle, I want you to, to tell us at the end, um, where is Social Venture headed, and wh what do we need to know before we leave here about all the, the, the new ways of making the world better in the next 10 years? But for the, for the students, I want to know, um, now you're all you're all in a pitch competition, and part of the the pitch and uh, the competition involves uh, winning some money. And obviously, every entrepreneur, including social entrepreneurs, needs money. But besides money, which is the obvious answer to the question, what do you need? What do you need from us in the room, from Columbia, from people out there, from society in general, in order to make your venture and social venture in general a success? So, what can we do to help you out, or what can we as a society do to help you out, other than just give you money? Uh, yeah, one minute each. So. Tell us. Yep. Well, I just think that uh, society should be very more vocal. So for one, I grew up in a chronic water scarce environment all my life in Chennai in India. And I have a teammate who grew up in a dengue fever uh, environment in Singapore, humid Singapore. We never really lobbied or spoke our, about the need to mitigate our heat. But now that we're here at Columbia and we have a voice, we speak up, people can listen in on this data solutions can pull all this together and swiftly spin that around into a solution. So I would just urge people at large to speak up on the problems you're possessive about. Okay. Um, vote in 2020, I think, is, is the biggest thing for us. Uh, I think we need to create an entirely new political atmosphere that's centered on people taking personal responsibility for the voting choices they make and the business choices they make uh, as one and the same. And I think that the best businesses um, that should succeed beyond 2020 uh, should come out of some kind of vision for the future that is, that's encapsulated in uh, the changes that we all choose to make in 2020. And um, obviously, I, I'm very new to, to entrepreneurship. I think this is one way to attack the problem. Um, I think the problem of climate change is just so much bigger than any one startup could, could solve. or even have a, a, a measurable um, impact on. So uh, hopefully we succeed and get somewhere, but, but I think uh, you know, the, the new political future is, is far more important to all of our, the future of our, our, our climate than, uh, than anyone's startup could be. Uh, kind of a point on social impact and uh, social impact investing specifically, uh, because they're all kind of socially impacting uh, ventures. Uh, I truly believe that here in the next few years we're going to see a, a shift in how we foresee private and public organizations and how we go about um, investing and, and kind of really being involved with their social their social impact uh, and, and their causes. Uh, as you look at a, at a company and really see what they're looking to do and, and how they're going about it, uh, I think it would be much, even more transparent than it is today. Um, and, and with that. Yeah. Uh, for me, like uh, relating to the problem that we are going to solve with our venture, which is the negative stigma from the employees from the private sector from the company to this graduate, we hope that when we launch an uh, entirely the, the, the platform and we are able to uh, achieve our key metric to upskill the soft skill of this graduate. Like we expect the private sector to start to open their mindset, start to open the recruitment for this graduate. So the uh, support from the private sector is also vital to ensure the success of this platform. Um, I think for me, I uh, request two things. The first one, advice, you know, your ex expertise. I just had a quick discussion with Kyle uh, outside, you know, like I receive valuable advice. The thing is, if you work on education, something like that, I'm very happy, I will be very happy to uh, connect, um, to, to, to discuss more about this. The second one, um, it's very interesting because in, in one of courses uh, I take in SIPA, not everyone believes in social entrepreneur. Because not everyone believes that as one company can uh, generate profit, but also create impact for social good. So I think those, um, um, you know, like promote 
social entrepreneurship may be an uh, idea. You know, I, I uh, have been involved in social enterprise for a long time. Five years. That's right, five full years. No, uh, I, I've been involved for uh, a long time. I own one of the churches, 28 years it, uh, old, but, but I've been involved with other institutions prior to that. And, and, you know, the thing I think we need to all remember, first of all, like you're sitting in front of a panel of young heroes. They're taking on extraordinarily difficult issues that they have recognized. They had the wherewithal to take 10 steps back, and they didn't just drive for their own ends. They took 10 steps back from their countries, from their sectors, from whatever they could have avoided and ignored. They're at Columbia. You can walk out of here with a degree from Columbia and ignore the rest of the world pretty much for the rest of your life. But they've chosen, even at this early point, to never do that. To look and say, what are the failures that are holding back our countries, our communities, the individuals who they've interacted with, and they've recognized it, and they've analyzed it, and they are throwing themselves into it. And so a big round of applause for these young people. The, the second thing I want to say is what all of them are far too polite to say. I, I've done a lot of work analyzing the field. I work with some friends in, uh, around the world to analyze what are the big barriers to social enterprise. And number one, I know you're going to want to start in the country, it's money. It's money. You know, we can say that it's advice, and we can say that it's, you know, a hard pat on the back, but that's really not what it is. This is a brand new sector. We're about 40 years in to building this field. Think about what the agricultural sector looked like 40 years in, right? No one had even figured out how to tie a plow to a horse by then. Think about what the industrial such a white knuckle death grip on the steering wheel of their own organizations that it's almost impossible for them to find the bandwidth to reach over and say, you know what, you're working on this, or you're working on climate change. I bet my 460,000 members who are educators, I bet they might care about climate change too. And so collaboration and the lack of collaboration it will inhibit the entire sector if we don't figure out how to address capital issues, right? And so
so I want to encourage all of us to recognize that there is such firepower in this sector. When you look at these, look at these people who are sitting in front of you. It's awesome. But what we have to do together is say, how do we figure out financial markets and collaborative strategies that will break this field open so that they can really do what they've all been doing for years. Thank you guys all for being here. And thank you guys for everything you're doing. Okay, hey, three, three quick things and then we're, we're all going home. No, number one, if you go onto the Greater Good website, greatergoodgathering.org, uh, their names and the names of their uh, startups are all listed. Uh, thanks to the wonders of the internet, you can track them down from there. Uh, please track them down, uh, give them advice, give them support, most of all give them money, I'm sure they'll all be appreciative. All right? uh, secondly, people, um, people read my articles, I write about the subjects we've been talking about the last two days a lot, and what my friends always tell me is they were depressed for a week after they read my latest article. Everybody thinks I'm, I'm pessimistic. I'm not, and there's only one reason why. It's because of everything we've heard in the last two days, uh, the answer is sitting right in front of you. Uh, I, I know a lot of young people, I teach, and I, these folks are the salvation of the planet. Uh, the future is bright because of them, and I believe in them. Uh, third and finally, the Greater Good Gathering itself is a startup. We're in our third year, but I think we've kind of um, gotten over the, uh, the valley of death, and we're going to be around. We're going to be back here next year. Uh, I want all of you to be as well. Uh, come back, spread the word, be part of this, and let's grow this into a nationwide conversation that hopefully makes the world a better place for everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>